All right, ladies and gentlemen, we'd like to welcome Dylan Williams of Footwork to the podcast. Appreciate you taking the time, man. Um, really enjoyed the podcast with you and Sean and uh, really love your journey and mindset. So, of course, wanted to have you on and really hear your story. Uh, I know you've had quite a great story. So, yeah, man, if you could just introduce yourself uh, to the audience, your name, where you're from, position, mm-hmm. and then mm-hmm. talk a little bit about your journey. Yeah, first off, thanks for having me, man. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm Dylan Williams, for those of you who, who've never seen or heard me before. Um, one half of Footwork Podcast, who Rick was just on telling, him, telling us his amazing story. So a little bit about me. I grew up in upstate New York, if you want to call it that. Uh, all the Long Island people will definitely call it that. It's about one hour north of New York City. Um, you know, grew up playing pretty normal pretty pretty normal club ball high school ball um you know went to college went to college at a small d3 school called suny oneonta um in upstate new york a very good team you know we went to two final fours so like a really solid d3 program there um i enjoyed some some good accolades i was uh all american for two years um you know conference player things like this and you know, I've spent some time out on the on, on left wing, right wing, but I would say I'm a I'm a center mid. I'm you know like an eight box to box. This is kind of my game, and yeah, I mean I have a I have a long story since since college, but that that's a little bit about you know how I kind of grew into into trying to play professionally and you know just realizing that this was my calling and something that I you know really wanted to pursue. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. For sure, man. So where, where'd you play your youth football? So I played at, um, it was like a local club. I'm from Monroe, New York. So it was like a local okay. club growing up. And then I uh, went over to this Soccer Plus Academy. It, we mm-hmm. had the name Academy, but it wasn't a true academy. And that was in Newburgh, New York, if anyone's ever heard of that. So that was a very good level. Unfortunately, some politics kind of split us up as kids. And then I went on to Ramapo um mm-hmm. Rampo Valley I believe so mm-hmm. not the most prestigious youth clubs playing up but um you know we were we were always there in state cup and in the final four final eight things like this playing in you know the big tournaments Bethesda Disney mm-hmm. things like this Potomac um mm-hmm. you know so didn't have the name and I think that might have hurt me a little bit going into into college you know not getting as many division one looks but mm-hmm. uh yeah, I mean, it, it is what it is, and it helps me um, become the player I am today. For sure, for sure. So how did, you know, obviously it's very cold up there. Did you do a lot of your training indoors with the clubs? Yeah, I mean, the winter was always, um, I don't know if you remember those, like, you remember those yellow sponge balls? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, that was like, yeah, that was a big part of it. I mean, winters uh-huh. were even worse back then, so a lot of indoor on gym floors, you know, really working on your touch and things like this. And as a kid, you don't know any better, you know, this is just what, sure. this is what you're used to. And mm. we didn't have, we didn't have that futsal growing up, you know, like I didn't play futsal until I was in high school. Yeah. Like I didn't even know that there was a ball that existed that, you know, didn't bounce like this. Ours were like going all over the place. Uh-huh, so uh-huh. yeah, a lot of training, a lot of training in the winter. I'm sure like you, like you did yourself. Of course, of course. Yeah, so like you said, you you said you knew football was your calling. When did you really realize that? That's a bit of a roller coaster ride for me because, you know, early on in, you know, like those yearbook things where you say what you want to be when you grow up. I have a few yeah. pictures, uh, still saved on my phone too. You know, I love them. I look back at them and it's like, what do you want to be when you grow up? And it's a soccer player you know, mm-hmm. favorite subject, math, I don't know, how to, that kind of shit. But yeah. I have that a few times. And as a kid, you know, I really, truly believed it. And mm-hmm. I think as I got older, it became less realistic to me just because of the opportunities I was getting, you know, going to a division three team, you know, not playing in one of the best club teams. Mm-hmm. And I just felt like, I don't know, maybe I didn't say it out loud, but I definitely felt this wasn't as possible as, you know, as a kid, you couldn't tell me otherwise, you know? Mm -hmm. And 
Yeah, I mean, uh, in college, it came back to me again just because I was having a lot of fun playing. We had an amazing group of guys, amazing coach, Coach Byrne there. And mm -hmm. I just felt like I was really developing as a player. And one of the main things was I didn't feel like I hit a pinnacle yet. Like, I felt mm -hmm. like there's no way that this is as good as I can be. Like, I can get to another level. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't even really about, like, being a professional i mean yeah it sounded nice and i'm sure i posted on instagram a few times about professional contracts and stuff but it really came down to like i knew i could get better and i just wanted to see how far i could take it mm -mm. no it's interesting man because i always i'm sure you get the question a lot i always get the question of am i too old to play professional or um you know yeah. what's the correct age and at the mm -hmm. end of the day, what I've really discovered on my journey, speaking to other players and, and coaching other people and seeing everyone else's journey, you know, it's these cliche sayings that, you know, your path is your path. It's your own journey. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's really true because uh, like I've talked about many times before, you see guys like Rooney, other guys who broke into the first team at 15, 16, they have a different path. They've been playing first team minutes um you know from from that age you know putting those minutes on their body and mm -hmm. you know guys who are quote late bloomers you know who broke into the game later um maybe didn't have as much uh of the development that we wish we would have had like players in Europe um realize that wow this is really you know my time my own timing and if i take my development into my own hands and i am really about this life and I'm really committed, then I can make it happen. And and that's mm -hmm. kind of what it sounds like what you've gone through. Um, how was your, your, like the youth system? How often were you training per week? Um, were there other players interested in getting into college, things like that? Yeah, so we had players that were interested in getting into college. Um, you know, we had, uh, we had a, a pretty ambitious team in, in terms of you know, people were focused, but it was only like two to three times a week, you know, kind mm -hmm. of pretty much the basic you get in the U.S. club system is like that two yeah. to three times a week. And yes, yeah, so I guess when, when high school came around, you know, the focus kind of was wavering. People are interested in doing other things, of course, mm -hmm. you know, that's when the parties are starting. That's when all these things are starting. And, you know, I was guilty of it, too. It's these are the parts of kind of I guess, growing and understanding what it takes and the commitment you kind of have to put down to, to achieve something like this. Yes. And to bring it back to your point, man, I mean, like, there's so many levels to this in terms of being a professional or being a semi-professional or just chasing this dream. It's like, people say, yeah, I'm too old because, you know, they get out of college and they didn't make that, you know, that super draft. And they just think like, well, this is it for me because I can't make the, you know, the English Premier League. I can't mm -hmm. make it to Syria. I can't make the Bundesliga. But there's just so many levels, especially abroad, as you know, that you can still like achieve that dream and get something that you, you know, get an experience that you never really thought was possible. Like playing in some, in, like I'm in Germany now and I'm sure we'll get into that later. But, you know, just playing in front of some of these fans that are like, hardcore for a fourth tier German team is just unreal. It's yeah. just something that you, I mean, you, you just wish you could throw at people like, this is what you could experience if you just give it a shot because yeah, you didn't grow up in the manual use system. And obviously that is a very, very big, you know, advantage for these guys, but there's levels to it. And if you have the, yes ability and then of course you know even bigger is the determination to get better and adapt then there's so many levels to this professional game it's unreal love that 100 percent. and i think one of the big things is also you know people love metrics people love numbers and sometimes you know they are good to go off of but when you tell you know your boys or um, your even your family in the beginning back home uh, who might not be as familiar with european football that you know i'm playing fifth tier germany just got into fourth tier. They don't see it as ambitious and, and they don't realize how much of a quote religion it is over here, over in Europe mm -hmm. and um, how serious these people take it. And yeah, just exactly. like you said, um, you know, there's, there is so many levels to it. And, and like we talked about on your podcast and what I love to get into is, 
you know, football really teaches us about, you know, life and, and really teaches us about uh, our journey personally. You know, everyone mm-hmm. likes talking about personal development. And one of the best things you can do to, quote, find yourself is chase your dream. And, and mm-hmm. no matter what anyone says, you just keep going. And as we both know, the guys who do make it um, and do end up playing like against Bayer Leverkusen, Roberto Bremen, guys, you know, Hanover that you've played against. So the ones who, are, who stay consistent and persistent on the path and they don't really care what others are saying um, mm-hmm. behind their back or what are you doing? Because, you know, I had a couple of friends do that. I'm sure you did. Like, oh, why are you going over there playing, you know, fifth tier or this and that? And, you know, you just stick to your to your path at the end of the day if you really believe it's for you. Yeah, that's self, uh, it's 100% right. That self-belief is the most important thing when you do something even close to this. I mean, in really any realm of life, when you go into something, the self-belief is the thing that's going to drive you to to do the best that you can, to be the best version of yourself. And yeah, I had, I mean, so out of college, I had, um, I had a, a job already lined up. I had said yes to it with um, this investment bank called JP Morgan, where I was, mm-hmm set up an investment banking in a very good part of it. And this was like, you know what I was, I was business economics in college and, you know, coming out, it was like, I think 75 grand, something like this, like first year, you know, money I've never seen before as a college student, you know, scraping by to get, to get beers and drinks and, you know, to have a good time in college. Yeah. Get the natty lights, you know, whatever's on on special at the, uh, the gas Uh, station or Rite Aid. And yeah, there was like, that was a very hard um, decision for me because at the time, you know, I wasn't, I was coming out of college. I wasn't getting like professional looks, even though I enjoyed a very, I would say a very good college career. Um, Mm -hmm. And it was like, well, do I do this? You know, do I take quote unquote the safe route? You know, there was nothing wrong with that route. You know, there was good people who were doing it. I had some friends that were doing it. You know, I was in the city, great place to be. And you know, I was making money, I would be comfortable. Mm -hmm. But there was just something ticking in me that was like, you know, I could come back to this. And, you know, I'm very, I'm very lucky and very, very grateful for the circle that I've, you know, kind of, I have around me and that the people that I allow into my circle, because, you know, they were saying like, yeah, uh, you know, like, it, it is a tough thing to give up. But if, if it's not your dream, you could always come back to this. You could you could work investment banking in your 30s if that's something you want to do. And they weren't just yes man too though. They were like, if you, awesome. if you if you say no to this, you have to literally give everything to pursue this dream. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I, you know, I did have people who were telling me I was crazy. I had someone come up to me and was like, "You turned down that job to do what?" Like you played at a D3 college, you think you're going to be a professional soccer player. And, you know, those things fuel, you know, I'm sure you're the same way. The, the, the that haters are high motivation. Exactly. It's just great fuel. And obviously I want to prove it to myself, but I love proving people wrong. And I have no, you know, doubts about that. And I'm not ashamed or embarrassed to, to admit that. Like I love proving people wrong mm-hmm. and I love when people talk and then, you know, I kind of, hopefully can show up with some action. And, you know, it was, it was a tough decision back then, but I mean, something obviously I wouldn't have changed for the world, especially with, Mm -hmm. with how far I've come and how much I've learned. Yeah. I love that, man. Two things to say, I mean, to that is, you know, I, my stepdad always told me, you know, because I was actually, when I first went to school, I was majoring in pre-dentistry. Like, uh, what was I doing? He's like, you can always be a dentist, doctor, lawyer, at any age, but you can't always be a footballer. And that's just the truth. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, and, and to add to that, what I've realized is, you know, you know, we're not, um, you know, in a relationship, we're not, we're not married with a wife and kids. So now's the time to, to be that journey, man. Um, and as we both know, you learn so much from it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't mean to cut you off there, but it's like, no it's it's the twenties. I feel I'm, and this is not to, to, to hate on anyone who's taking doing something a little differently than me, but I just feel like your 20s are, are, are a good time to really find yourself and then just explore. I mean, yes. maybe these are just my you know, values and things that I very, like, really highly value. You know, when you take those tests and it's like, 
the, the kind of like the personality test. Yeah, you know, yeah. Like how much do you value this at work? And it's like, you know, money, you know, good people around you and things like this. Like when I was, when I would take those money would never be like the highest. And that was part of the reason why I kind of, you know, discovered like, okay, I need to try something else first and then come back and, and reassess because mm -hmm. like adventure is one thing that I value so much, like pushing myself outside of my, my, my comfort zone, you know, really pushing boundaries and, yes. and learning. These are like the things that I love the most. And I'm sure you feel the same way. You can, we can apply these very, very well, especially in the last, Damn, how long has it been since college? Five, four or five years now? So, mm -hmm. yeah. No, I love that, man. And something I always refer back to is you can always make more money, but you can't make more time. And, you know, what I've realized and, you know, like we talked about on your podcast is, you know, these these experiences and these things that these life um, qualities, these characteristics we've de we continue and have developed living over here in a foreign country, like you said, putting yourself in different, um, in, in a uncomfortable zone, not being in your comfort zone, uh, new languages, uh, new culture to discover how to really not finagle your way, but, you know, communicate with people and work things out. That'll be valuable for the rest of our life. And mm -hmm. those skills, the, I really have discovered one of the most important things for me is um, just like being able to build personal relationships with people, like true personal relationships. And the second thing is putting energy and passion and love into what you do. Because when you do that, people feel that. Mm -hmm. And that's something that, like you said, your 20s and your 30s, you know, even your mid 30s, you're building, you're building. Yeah. And then, you know, people want these get rich quick schemes and this and that. But what we learn over here, Chase, and what, what, we, what we're doing is, we can use this for the rest of our life and build legacy and build wealth and teach people. And that's what I, what I've really come to uh, love about this journey. Um, yeah. And yeah, it's just, yeah. 100%. Yeah. Uh, so well said. I mean, just a, a few things to add on, on a personal level is I feel like, I don't know, someone, someone, one of my mentors called me a sponge once. And I, I really like that because how he described it was like, you can soak up the situation and you can adapt to it. That like adaptability, yes. like the things that I've had to adapt to in these last four or five years, I just feel like I can really handle anything from a different route, from a different business path, from, a, from life. You know, like I have a lot of things that I've had to overcome. And one of the main things is like, I don't know if I would have it's going to sound cheesy. I don't know if there's a better way to like say it, but I feel like I really found myself or I'm in the process of finding myself so well that I may not have had from a, from a different path. You know what I mean? Like if I had exactly. taken that job, I just don't know if I would have truly like come to terms with who I am and who I want to be and the things that I value and the relationships I value and who knows, mm -hmm. maybe but mm -hmm. it feels like it kind of worked out well for a reason in this. And mm -hmm. there was one other point with, with what you said. And I think it just comes down to like the amount of energy we put into something like this, like the get rich quick schemes and, you know, working for the paycheck is just think of how much energy you are wasting on something that you don't actually enjoy. Like there are so many hours of your life that you are putting into something that you don't like. Mm -hmm. And to me, and you're that putting is a very something out someone else's someone else's name instead of behind your name. Yeah, of course. And I mean, even if you did have a boss, like even in mm -hmm. that situation, that's fine. But if you liked what you were doing and you found value in it and you enjoyed it enough to put energy in, like enough of like you know, your passion and, and just the type of person you could be like your potential into something. To me, that is, that is something that is invaluable and something that I, I personally need to have in my life. And I've found sure. that on this journey where I just don't think I could do something again after this, you know, when this path is over that I truly didn't feel like I could put hours of my passion and my talent into. It's just, mm -hmm. it's really taught me 
what is needed in my life. I feel like mm-hmm. on, on the biggest, biggest scale. For sure. No, I love that. And I love the, the adaptability part. And also, you know, I, it's, it's based, I like to always call it like the solution based mindset. So it's like, you know, throw whatever you, you want at me and I'll figure it out. And, and that's, that's what I hear in your voice. And I think you really have to have to quote survive over here and, and, and mm-hmm. keep going. Yeah. It's a, it's a, a little trick that I do sometimes is it's like a, it's a similar thing, but I guess it's more slang. Like, have you ever heard someone say like, I want all the smoke. You ever heard that? Yeah. Sometimes when I, when I, when I see myself in like a, a challenging situation, I kind of say that to myself and I don't know why, but it just kind of tricks me into like, yeah, I want all the smoke. Like, let's go. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. you know, I'm ready for Bring this. It it's, just, yeah. it's just one of those things. Yeah. It's like, I'm ready. I can adapt to anything. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Love it. No, and then one thing I wanted to give out, uh, you know, a little practical tip for the listeners that I do that I learned from a um, combination of David Goggins and this guy, that guy, Tom Bilio at Impact Theory. Whenever you have someone that actually doesn't believe in you and has the, the, the balls to come up to you and say something or whatever, write it in your notepad. And whenever you yeah. have that, that urge not to train, not to do some of the extras, not to give it your all at training not to, you know, take care of your diet and your sleep. Look back at those names. Cause sometimes, mm-hmm. you know, like Dylan said, you know, you got to prove it to yourself, which is huge, but sometimes that outside, that dark side motivation really helps you. And it's something that I, that I've done. That's really helped me over the years, just in your notepad, write the names. And it's, it's quite simple. Yeah, absolutely. I, I've, I've done similar things where I've wrote it on pieces of paper. People who told me I'd never play at this certain level or, or something. And, Sean and I talked about this on our podcast is like, we, we, we flirt with the idea of sending these people postcards, but we haven't, we haven't <laughs> quite that. got there yet, but maybe, maybe one day. You never That's know. awesome. That's awesome. But yeah, man, let's get back into it. Um, so how'd you get recruited for Oneonta? So just from, just from club ball, um, I think from some state cup games, um, coach Ian Byrne there, uh, legend, um, Grew up in South Africa, played professional ball there and um, had trials in England and things like this. Like really knows the sport, really knows the game. Um, and I think he was a similar player to myself. So I was, you know, a pretty skinny guy, not the tallest. Um, but I was I was good on the ball. I have good vision and, you know, good work ethic. And I think I have a very good mind for the game as an American. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it takes a foreign coach to see those things. I think yes, and yes. he saw that and he, no, he was like, he was honest with me. He's like, I don't know how you're going to, you know, you're going to adapt to the physical game. And in my mind, I'm like, come on, like I can adapt to the physical game. And then sure enough, I, you know, I, I didn't prove him wrong, but I was, you know, kind of rewarding him for, for, for giving that trust in me. And I, you know, I played well and, yeah, uh, Oneonta, you know, college ball was a very, very good time for me, for my teammates. And yeah, I think it's it's easy to say, like, I wish I would have just gone to Europe before then. But I think for me, college was necessary because it really helped me develop into a player that I thought personally that I had the confidence in where I could take this somewhere, whether it was in the U.S. or abroad. I feel like you know, some people may not need that and you can, you can really do well with having those four extra years. But for me, it was like, I needed those four years to, to become a better player, especially mentally. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, for sure. I love that. Um, because at the beginning of the conversation, you mentioned how good the group was, how good the camaraderie over there was. And I think, like you said, being in that environment, being in that community is so helpful to. Um, really, like you said, discover that true love and, and that want to, to play at the next level and, and really just enjoy the game, you know, and, and mm. you know, find yourself within the game. And, and as we both know, like you said before, that confidence, that self-belief is the biggest thing. And when you have yeah. that self-belief and that confidence, then you can play your best football. Um, yeah. But yeah, I like, I like how you said that. What was the what was the thing that you really noticed about that, that community of footballers that, that, um, 
really helped you gain that confidence and, and take your game to the next level? I would say the competition that we would have in training was to me almost harder than the games because we had a, a deep team and we had players that really wanted the spot. Like on the field, we'd get in fights. We'd, you know, we would yell at each other. There'd be like war in some of these games, you know, but then afterwards it was like, that shit is left on the field and we're, we're a group of brothers. And mm-hmm. I love that, man. And I, you know, the, one of the best things is like about a team is that is having yes. that group that you can go to war with and that you could even be at war with each other during the times where you're trying to really get better. But that's, mm-hmm. we just wanted to win. And that's what really, I think that competition, everyone wanted to win more than anything. Yep. Mm-hmm. And we knew, we knew that we could do it together. And we knew if we pushed, you know, each other in, in training in, in these small side of games and these, you know, friendlies that we could be as good as we thought we could. And mm-hmm. we just had limitless potential and, yeah, the, the we were a competitive fucking group. Sorry, can we curse mm-hmm. on here? Yeah, why not? <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah, a very competitive group. Mm-hmm. No, no, that, that winning culture is huge. And, you know, what you just said about, you know, fighting on the pitch and really, you know, wanting to, to win yourself, wanting to win for your team, wanting to get better. And then off the field, you know, being brothers and being boys again brings me back. I was listening to a podcast uh, yesterday where, you know, uh, Shaq was on the podcast and the the interview host asked him his relationship with Kobe. And he said, he said, man, when we got on the court, you know, and we were competing against each other, it was, you know, we would fight. We would curse at each other. We would scream at each other. But he said, when, when we played another team, when we faced the opponent, and he was in trouble. He, he knew that I would be there. And when I was in trouble, I knew he would be there. And off the court, we were brothers. And, and that's basically what you just said. It's, you know, competing every day. And like you said, competing in a winning culture, really just, um, I think developing yourself as a winner is, is, is huge. Mm. Yeah, especially, I mean, in any sport, I just feel like knowing how to win and is one of the is just another thing that's invaluable and i knew like i could count on these guys i knew that i could count on players if i wasn't having my best game or if he wasn't having his best game we knew that the person to our our left or our right could pick the other person up and someone could be the one that you know brings us over that that day or you know Mm -hmm. the next day in that game and yeah i mean we went really far we had we went to two final fours um both ended very, you know, kind of in heartbreak. We we thought we really deserved at least the one my junior year. We really thought we were that team was really we shouldn't have been touched, and we thought we could have taken it home the national championship. But yeah, some things were meant to be at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Interesting, man. So so after your four years at Oneonta, what was your what was your next step? How did, like you said, you know, you declined the offer at, at JP Morgan. What was, you know, your next step after that? So even just to take it back to how my college career actually ended was we went into a penalty shootout in the final four um, and mine was saved. And that was how I ended my college career. And that was a very, very hard pill to swallow for, for yeah. many months. And it, I mean, I had, I had like, you know, Sean and I from, from footwork, you know, we were training that whole year and we were training the off season because we were thinking about like, well, I can't speak for him, but I was thinking like, yeah, we could, you know, try for some teams and try and keep this thing going. But in my head, I was also juggling that JP Morgan offer. And then how my college career ended kind of had another seed in my head, you know, planted another seed. Like I can't go out like this, you know, I can't go out on a miss, like no way. So. I mean, as graduation kind of came around, that's when I ultimately, you know, after a few like really tough days of conversations with parents and things, like I decided to decline that offer. And then I didn't have anything at the time, but I was in talks with a, with a few t- clubs, um, like a few USL clubs uh, about trials, but nothing ever materialized. And I mm-hmm. was very naive to the game. You know, I thought like, 
I was going to walk into these places. But again, I play D3. These people don't know me. Like how many D1 players are coming out? How many foreigners are coming out? And this is when the USL and um, NASL were like, you know, pretty, they were growing and they were getting a lot of good talent. So I was doing combines. You know, I did a few different combines. Um, one was this info sport one, which was like mm-hmm. the week before the uh, MLS draft combine in Florida. And I spent like too much money on just, it was BS, complete BS. <laughs> some of these combines can be. Uh, I did another one in Virginia, which was like, okay, but uh, I wasn't picked, even though I thought I did very well. And, you know, these things were kind of knocking me down a little bit and kind of question, I was questioning like, you know, what am I going to do here? So I was, I signed with um, an MPSL club. Um, so amateur club, um, kind of from my area, Kingston Stockade, it was their first season, you know, great group of guys, um, great organization. They really make it like feel pro, you know, but Mm -hmm. at the end of the day, it wasn't, and it was only a summer season. So, you know, I did well in that. And then I was trying to take, you know, still this energy for playing into some more combines. And I did a soccer visa combine. So um, with Joe Funicello and his whole organization and group. And yeah, it was like a a few day combine. There was an ID one first where they, you know, they try and get some of the good players and I did well. uh, And I went to the next round or whatever it was. It was, I think, a month later. And first day I do well. Second day I'm doing very well in like the the games because I think the first day was only you know, like kind of mechanic stuff and then maybe some small side and maybe some finishing. I did well. Um, and then the second day was the full fielded friendlies. And I think I scored, had an assist. And then during that game, I go up for a header and totally accidentally, another guy is going up and he kind of reaches his elbow out yeah, and clocks me right here, like in the cheekbone kind of area. Yeah. And at the time, I mean, it hurt like hell, man. I was like, God damn, but I I didn't think like I was I was gonna come off. Like I didn't think there was anything like super wrong with me. I just mm-hmm. thought like he got in a good shot, and then my nose was bleeding. So they put in like one of those tampon things, and it soaked mm-hmm. through, like completely soaked through quickly. Uh-huh. And so they put in another one, and then I like tried to go back out, and they were looking at me, and like everything was kind of swelling up, and they were like, "Nah, man, you got to go to like the emergency room." So I go to the emergency room and sure enough, like my entire cheekbone is shattered, Jesus. like completely shattered. And I needed like plastic surgery, I guess. I mean, that sounds kind of weird, but it was in terms I have now mm. titanium in here, like wow. in my cheek, wow. all from this, all from this combine. Now, luckily, I mean, I don't know if it was a good thing or a bad thing at the end of the day, but luckily I did well enough before that where they were very impressed. And maybe I just went out on a good note. Like I didn't make any mistakes after that and yeah, I didn't have yeah. to go to the next day. So they just had this one idea of, of me in their head, I guess. And yeah, they just like, they told me I was on my way home because I had to go set up like some things with doctors and, and, and get surgery. But they called me and they were very, they said they were very impressed and they were going to be on the lookout for me. It's basically what it was. So I was still... Mm-hmm you know, kind of in an area of unknown. I had no idea what was going to happen. And then I'm away Thanksgiving with some, some family and I get a call from one of the guys there and he's like, I have this, uh, this contract for you, uh, this team in Tasmania, Australia. I'm like, what the Tasmania? What the hell? (laughs) And he's like, yeah, it's, it's a second tier. Like it's this gives me all the details and stuff. Like this is when the season starts. Um, and he's like, yeah, take a little bit of time, think it over. So I did. I thought it over. At the time, I didn't really have anything else. You know, I was looking into some other things, but I kind of just decided to take that leap. And luckily enough, I was getting my surgery very soon. And their their season ran a little bit differently than the European seasons. Mm-hmm. It's more like the Scandinavian where it's, I believe it's... um like March to October, something like this. So it gave me enough time to get my surgery and heal and uh, work my way up a little bit in fitness. And yeah, that was basically it. I I did well at that combine. 
they were impressed. Um, one of the agents that worked with Saka Visa hooked me up with this this first contract that was on the other side of the world in in Australia. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So you know a lot of a lot of players. You know, you seem like you did really well and went in went in with a positive mindset. Um, what's you know when you go into combines, obviously there are a lot of players. Um, you don't know what it's going to produce. Is there a certain mindset that you go into? Any any advice that you could give the players when going into a trial, going into a type of combine like this where, you know, most of the time individuals are there just to perform well for themselves. So they may be taking extra touches. Uh, they might mm-hmm. not be seeing you when you're making your runs. Mm-hmm. Um, is there any, you know, approach that you, that you kind of take when going into these, you know, open combines or an open trial or something? Yeah, I mean you're 100 percent right. Is that these at, at combines, especially, is you see a lot of guys that are out for themselves, and that's not really my game. I'm not a huge one v one beat three players and you know score a goal. I'm more link. I'm more you know getting assists. I can I can do some of that work too. But my thing was always I just wanted to show my game because I know my game and I'm confident in my game. And I know that other people will, you know, maybe do something more fancy or, you know, maybe beat a guy. But I know if I do the things that I'm very good at with no fear, that was one of the things I struggled with in the beginning was like, you know, you have to stand out at these combines. You have to think of how many people are there. Some are quite big, you know, open trouts too. Some are very big. And sometimes they've never heard of you before. So you Mm -hmm. have to make an impression. Not Mm -hmm. only the first impression, but the second and third, you have to stand out and you have to... Mm -hmm. Keep have have these guys keep looking back at you and then remembering you as the day goes on. Mm-hmm. And for me, that starts with not having fear. Like get on the ball, make mistakes, and then show that you don't cower away after a mistake or you don't. Love it. Not, you're not doing anything because you're afraid of losing the ball. And yeah, I mean, like some guys again might overshadow you with you know cool moves and goals and stuff. Especially me, that's not my game. But I knew if I was vocal, I knew if I was getting stuck in the tackles, I knew if I was fit, you have to be fit in these things. I knew that if I played my game, did the some things right, and then, you know, was just always there, like mm-hmm. always talking, always trying to get on the ball, always directing. Like these are the things that stand out to, to these guys if you're not the one that's scoring a goal. And you can have a bad day too at a combine too, but if you're doing all those other things, you're still in their mind is making good impressions of, Oh, he can do this. Oh, he can do this. Oh, he can do this. So Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I I had to learn that over the, over the course of the the many combines and even the trials that I had to do later. So it's kind of a similar idea of just trying to play with as little fear as possible. Just knowing that if I make a mistake, I can correct it. You know, if it's not right away the next time, just not letting it halt you from, from, you know, doing something the next time and then just being confident in the player I am and showing what I know I can do. I mm-hmm, can't mm-hmm. dribble three people. So I'm not going to do that. Cause that's going to make me look bad in that area. Let's well, just, it doesn't make any sense. So mm-hmm. yeah, from, from those things, I think, yeah, hopefully guys can pull some, some advice. No, I, I love that man. And I love the <clears throat> knowing and identifying your strengths and playing to them. And then also knowing your weaknesses And, you know, not hiding from them, but not going to those. And what I also hear in that and what I always have have, have thought about is, you know, people say, you know, you want to be that standout player. And that's 100% true. But being a standout player doesn't mean that you have to go do four scissors, beat a guy and score. Like you Mm -hmm. said, being a standout player can be that guy who's consistent, uh, gets on the ball, vocal, makes things happen. And like you said, reacts well to their mistakes. And then also what, what digging back to before what you said about, um, coach Bernard Onianta, there may be some, some coaches watching or, or for example, Joe, I mean, you know, he, he's had experience in Europe. He knows the game so he can see, he can look past the physical presence. And because, you know, obviously in America, hopefully it's changing, you know, they look first at the physical presence, but obviously in Europe, we both know they look at the decision making. So guys mm-hmm. like Joe, they'll be, oh, wow, this guy Dylan, you know, he makes the right decision at the right time. 
knows when to pass, knows when to dribble, directs the team. And when they see, you know, when coaches, like we both know, it's an opinion game. If, if some coaches have grown up in the European game and they take their coaching style from that, they could, they could pick you out. And then, yeah, I mean, all those things that you said are huge. Yeah, it's definitely helpful. I think, I think my game is a little more tailored to at least how American system was when I was first trying to break out into the scene. I think it's changing now. I think yes. um, as more, not even as more foreigners, just as maybe the education of coaches and the availability of, of, you know, learning and learning how to coach and learning the game and watching the game, seeing these players that, you know, can be the player of the game and be five foot four, you know, like mm-hmm. N'Golo Kante, like things like this. And, you know, finding the people who can pull the strings and, you know, that's a, that was very, it was a very European style when scouting the game. I think it's coming to the U S but I think at least in my opportunities, besides, um, Joe, who, like you said, played in, uh, Europe. So he kind of was, you know, around that and experienced mm-hmm. those things. Mm-hmm. Sometimes, sometimes it takes that coach or that scout or that agent to kind of recognize your game. So, yeah, I mean, I was, I was denied a lot of times, but it felt good when someone appreciated that game that I knew I could bring to a team and someone else saw it for sure. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 100% man yeah I mean like like I always say and I'm sure you fully believe it's like it only takes one coach one agent to believe in you and then once that happens and like we talked about before when you have that confidence under that coach you can perform at your best and you never know what what happens many more people have said no to me than they said yes but the yeses mean everything like you only need a few yeses to really make a career and I've, mm-hmm. I've heard a lot of no's and I've had a lot of no answers, which is even worse. But the yeses were, I mean, few and far between, but they mean everything. They give, sure. they gave, you know, they gave me my entire career to this point. Sorry, you cut out for a bit. You hear me now? Is all good? Yeah. yeah. What were you saying? They gave, the yeses gave you entire... Higher. Yeah, they just gave me they gave me my career to this point. So, you know, exactly. I'm in debt to those yeses and I don't even really think about the no's. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, just just diving into that, though, real quick, because we know a lot of ex- players are going to experience experience it and experience it from an emotional standpoint. Obviously, that first sting of the no, it hurts. Mm-hmm. How How would you advise players if they, you know, when they're denied opportunities when they're told no that they're not good enough or there's no space on the team what what do you, what's your best method or best piece of advice to, to deal with that mm. you know first I don't want to I don't want to just pretend like it's you know and I know we're we're trying to give advice here but I, I want to be candid where it's it's really not it's not always the easiest thing like it it hurts to be told no so mm-hmm. I, I, I kind of want to relate to guys out there that are that are hearing it, you know, it's, it's not easy, but you can't take it personally because you yes. mentioned before, it's like, this is a game of opinions. And there's a lot of coaches that said no to me at levels that were less than the level I'm playing at now. So for me, that's just like, okay, well, they didn't see it. It's not even that they were wrong. I mean, maybe, yeah, but they just didn't see it. They didn't see mm. what I could bring. Someone mm-hmm. else may see that. So you just have to think like not to take it personally. Because mm-hmm. if, if someone saying no is going to affect how you continue to play, then it, it, maybe it's just not the career path for you. Mm-hmm. you know? mm-hmm. No, that's awesome. And, and I completely relate to that. And something that I always like to think about is maybe those no's happen for a reason. And, you know, you are where you are because of those no's. Um, and, and looking back on it, you can, like we said from the beginning, you use those no's to your fuel. And then, like you said, you know, sometimes the, the coach may not notice it. Sometimes you weren't on your best day. And at the end of the day, it could all work out for the right reasons. Yeah, 100%. Like I said, I've, I've been said no to teams that were not as good as the team I'm on now. So for me, if I, if those teams would say, yes, maybe I didn't make it to this level, maybe, cause maybe I, was at a standstill somewhere else. 
So I count my blessings in those no's because one, it shaped me to just be a little more thick skin and then, you know, kind of dive deeper into the trust of myself. Like for mm-hmm. anyone who's, if anyone never listened to um, the audio book from Russ, it's called, it's all in your head. And he kind of just Not talked about like that. That's, have you ever heard it? Nah, I gotta listen. It's good, man. You would love, you would love it. It's a, it's a quick listen too. I think it's only like a two, right. two hour audio book. So it's, oh, really? it's, it's completely doable on a trip somewhere. Love it. And he kind of just talks about like, you have to be your biggest believer. And I felt like when people were saying no to me, and this is to anyone out there, if someone's saying no to you, you can kind of take it in two ways. You can take it as, okay, they may be right, or you can dive deeper into your self-belief. Mm-hmm. Now, like, be realistic with yourself. Like, if you're, if you're, like, if you don't have what it takes, this is something else you kind of have to mm-hmm. be intrinsic about and realize. But I'll, if you're confident and you know you can, and you have people around you who actually believe in you, you know, like you can dive into that self-belief and I feel like that's the path you want to take when that, when someone says no, it's like that, it's kind of like a fork on the road of, well, you can take that in and be like, yeah, maybe he was right. Or you can, you know, kind of even place your bets more, kind of go more all in on yourself. And I mm-hmm. feel like that's a very important thing to do. I'd say, I mean, I wouldn't even just hold it to soccer or to things we're doing. I would say that and anything that you're passionate and confident in yourself about, no, I love it, man. I love it. That self belief is huge, man. Yeah. But yeah, how how did that uh how did your season in Australia go? How was your experience over there? So it was a little different because I came from such a winning program at Oneonta. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the MPSL season we did okay, um, but it was it wasn't a long season. It wasn't really like a full season. Um, so it was weird losing. We were kind of towards the bottom of the table, and there was some not problems, but like some promises that were made to me that were just not kept. And, you know, it was kind of the first time my eyes were open to the the, the dirty side of the game, like mm-hmm. whether it's the politics or the people telling you things that you want to hear or, you know, learning things like get everything in writing that you can, because those gentlemen agreements don't mean shit. Mm-hmm. And unless they're from people who are actually, you know, mean it are actually gentlemen so there was a lot of lessons rare to find in the game exactly yeah so i mean there was a lot of lessons that i learned in the game because it was in australia where i was it was a very hectic style it was very back and forth so i kind of learned um you know i was better at when there was a lot of pressure when there was a press on me of just trying to slow my, my thinking down to like, okay, do something simple here and get the ball back, you know, Mm -hmm. like trying to not overcomplicate things and yeah, like learning how to be the the worst team, but still finding a way to win, which I feel Mm -hmm. like is very, I think, honestly, I don't know any other sports where you can, you can be the worst team, but still win except in soccer. Mm Mm-hmm. Cause you can be pounded for, for 90 minutes, not have the ball, you know, 80, 20% possession and still, Mm -hmm. you know, dig your cleats in and just be vocal, organize, get into a low block and just find ways to get that one counter attack. And it was, it was a very, I think it was a very good skill for me to learn because it, it taught me how to win, not when, you know, everything was going right. Like in Oneonta, like I said, we were better than, you know, most teams, like 90% of the teams that we faced, mm-hmm. we were better than. So the victories came more from like, yeah, we're just playing well and stuff. But I found how to win. And I think that was one of the the greatest things that I could learn on the field. And then off yes. the field, I learned so much in that first year, man, about everything that is promised and how, you know, you think it's professional, but like you still got a long way to go. And yeah, and a lot of first lessons about how I had to become my own agent because I had an agent mm-hmm. that completely screwed that completely screwed me, and yeah, it was just like it was a it was a big time for me to grow up in this game and learn. And mm. I don't regret anything from it. It was a great experience. You know, I met a lot of great people. It was a beautiful part of the country, and yeah, it was just like I don't know. It was just really it was like ripping the bandaid off. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> I've never done anything like that. You know, I went to college three hours away from my hometown 
here I am for seven, eight months on a 24 hour plane ride away. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like it was, it was something that was very tough at times, but it ripped the bandaid off. And then I felt like so much more able to adapt. So I learned a lot on the field, but I would say I learned even more off the field that first year. And that's why I think it was so vital for me as, as a, as a player and as a person. Mm, Love that. Yeah. So like you said, you know, the number one thing on, on, on the field or one of the things that you learned that I hear is you added a different dimension to your game. And, and like you said, I think it's, it's very important to be able to, to find that, that, uh, that win, those three points, like you said, when you're not the better team, you're, um, and, you know, being able to find that, like you said, it's, it's, I heard you and Sean talk about that before on the podcast and I never really thought about it, you know, and it's, 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 interesting and that's why what makes footy so so beautiful um i think i think it gets a a bad rap sometimes of where people are like oh they play ugly football you know they play defensive football but if you look at it from just the terms of like you're trying to win that is the ultimate goal in this game i know like a lot of cultures and you know spanish culture and especially like barcelona is you want to win and you want to win with style yes but I mean that that's all well and good unless like your job's on the line and 100%. you know you could get relegated if you're not coming into a low block and letting the team have possession and then literally just bombing it, but bombing it at the right times. You know, it's like mm-hmm. I would rather play because it's just more of my game. I'm I'm better on the ball. You know, I'm I'm still not so tall or anything like this. I'm not a big guy, so I would rather play that attractive style. I think mm-hmm. it fits me more, but I think I had to learn like, okay, I have to add more parts to my game if I'm going yes. to succeed in this because you could play for a team that doesn't play the way that's going to bring the best out of you. Exactly. You have to learn to adapt to that because that's not going to adapt to you. No one's going to stop and say, all right, this guy's good on the ball. Like, you know, mm-hmm. we got to play on the ball because exactly. you get trashed that way. You could be open. So it's it was all, it was big about learning tactics too like just how to win and where to put myself in the best place to help my team even though it wasn't bringing out the best in me it was bringing mm. out the best version i could be on that day for the for for my team yeah no that's awesome man and and like you said you you learn you discover new parts of your game that you have to get better at you discover parts of your game that you didn't know were as good as they are um and yeah i think that's just crucial in development and, and like you said when you can find a way to to be a, a top consistent player on a team that doesn't play your style says a lot about you as a player and a person yeah i think it's a it's a huge thing for guys to 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 learn on the way especially if you're yes. kind of grinding out in these in these areas is they're not going to they're not going to play to the style that best suits you it's going to be the best that suits the team or best suits to win because a lot exactly. of the times that's what it is like survival is everything in, in these leagues survival mm-hmm, or promotion mm-hmm. or everything so you know these teams they could be people who are working full-time jobs for them could lose so much and the exactly. fans could put be putting so much pressure on you in these communities and stuff so it's it's i think it's a very i mean it's adaptability at the end of the day right it's just another version of trying to adapt to a situation to to just better the goal Mhm. Exactly. No, and like you said at the end of the day the what shows in the table, what shows in the fixtures is who got the 3 points, who got the point on the weekend. So like you said, I mean, you can always go back to that which I completely agree with you. I love playing, you know, good football passing style, but at the end of the day when the standings are there at the end of the season, you know, you see you see who has the points. Yeah, exactly. You guys get relegated, you might not have a contract next year. So what is the exactly. what's what's beautiful in that? Exactly. Exactly. No, I love it, man. So after Australia, what was your next move? So this was part of like my my learning my learning path here was just I had to, you know, kind of grind out and be my own agent because I, I put trust in an agent where he was gonna get me my next co- next contract. You know, mm-hmm. he was like, Okay, mm-hmm. just play here. This is good on your resume. But what they don't tell you is that Australia literally, well, at least my Australian experience, I mean, maybe if you play in a better, in the A-League or even in, you know, better, some of the better, you know, 
regional leagues because we were technically second tier, but there's many mm-hmm. different second tiers in Australia. So mm-hmm. maybe it looks better at some another club, but for me, it was like you played in Australia. What does that mean? It doesn't mean anything when you're getting into Europe. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think that is Europe in general. It's like it doesn't really yeah. matter where you were unless you've yeah. done it in Europe. And so I was very naive to this, and I just trusted an agent, paid him, and at the end of the day, nothing came from him after that. So I went back to to do a few combines and still is like, you know, not getting the looks. And it was tough for me because I felt like after that first contract, that was like it. You know, it was like mm-hmm. I made it. I won't struggle again. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. sure enough, I'm spending months like just training with no idea of what's coming next. Just mm. trying to stay fit. There's a combine here. Like, do I have um, the money to do this? Like, you know, trying to find these part-time jobs where I could leave at a moment's notice in case I did get a contract. And yeah, I did a few more combines and then I did this, this, um, this tour of like Iceland with a uh, soccer mm-hmm. visa where we like played a few professional teams mm-hmm. and we played a few, we played one, um, um, in the city Valor and it was like, they were, they had qualified for, the Europa League, I'm sure before, I'm pretty sure before. Mm. And like, so a good team. Mm. And, you know, I played and I, and we, I think we ended up losing like two or three, maybe even four zero, but I thought I did very well. And so did the, so did Joe, so did, um, he was the coach at the time for it. And nothing came of it, but it was also just like belief, like, okay, these guys are really good. And I still didn't, I didn't feel like completely out of place. Mm. So for me, it was almost like, yeah, it would have been great to get a contract right there or have someone interested in me there. But it gave me another like seed of belief where I was like, I can play at a higher level than what I played mm-hmm. at. Like I can, mm-hmm. I can keep reaching for this. And at the end of the day, nothing came from Iceland, but um, um, through one of Joe's connects, I went out to, to, um, to Sweden next. Um, I don't want to bad mouth it at all because like, again getting into europe i just felt i had to get into europe and then i mm-hmm. would start again it was kind of like starting over like this was like the first kind of break again mm-hmm. and it wasn't professional it was like you know semi-professional where we get food and housing and um a good coach we've had him on the podcast before uh dino mm-hmm. simpson if anyone wants to check that out good english coach um played with a bunch of americans we had like nine ten americans at one point playing all the team in sweden it was mad bro it was crazy Uh, and yeah it was that was a weird experience too it was also one that was i think really good for my my mental because it just it pushed me and i was living in a situation that wasn't as professional and i was still Mm. devoted to it and devoted to my goal and i was surrounding myself with guys um all these other Americans too, who had a similar goal. And so we were all pushing each other. And I thought that was very important because very helpful. the game, sometimes we'd scrape through and, you know, beat a team seven zero because this is not in the top tiers of Sweden, you know? And yeah, like we ended up winning the league there. Um, We got promoted. And then the team was like, we don't have the money to like improve your guys contracts or situations or anything like this. Mm. And that was tough because this whole time I felt like, okay, I'm sacrificing all of this time for this, like, kind of not shitty opportunity, but like, this is testing me. This is really mm. testing me right now of like, how much do I really want to do this shit? Because there are things here like that I don't want to live like this. You know, like, <laughs> there's a lot of extra stuff. Like, I don't want to have to deal with some of these extra things. And it was testing me because, like, I, I, and then again, I got like um, interest from a team in the, I believe in the tier that you played. Maybe it was a tier under that. It was either the second division or first. You, did, you played in the first division, right? Yeah, I played division one and then I played a couple months division two. So third tier, fourth tier. Yeah, so it was either third or fourth tier. And I felt like, okay, this is like halfway through the season. I was doing really well. I scored a ton of goals. Mm-hmm. And I was really had staffed. I had some video, like I put together a highlight tape and everything. And I got interest and they were like, yeah, come on trial. Like you seem really good. Let's see it. 
And I knew if I had played for this team on trial, I would a hundred percent sign. Like that's just mm-hmm. how confident I was. And then gauging the level of, you know, I, I just think I would have made it. And then my team ended up blocking it, even though it was kind of written into our contracts. This was part of the reason we got out Crazy. there was for the exposure. So they blocked that shit and I had to stay the entire year after that, wow. which was, it was another thing was like, you got to be kidding me. Yeah. But that's insane. It helped, it helped that they had interest because it was just giving me a little, you know, another seed where it was like, okay, someone's recognizing. Mm. And at the end of the year, the team, I guess they were pretty, they were pretty pissed that I didn't come on trial. Um, so they, they didn't really reciprocate that interest anymore. And then it was tough again because I wasn't getting crazy interest from, from, from leagues above, even though I had a really good season, but there was one team in the league above us who brought a couple of us on trial and I ended up, um, doing well there and it was a much better setup. Mm. And, but then I went home, you know, it was like kind of left on the table, like, all right, we'll be in touch. So I went home and I'm, I'm, I'm in New York during the winter and I'm enjoying time being home. I'm blowing off a little steam of um somewhat stressful season, although it had, mm-hmm. I mean, a many perks of, of living in Europe, living in a beautiful country sure. like Sweden, so many mm-hmm. things. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And then I'm home for a bit and I'm still, I'm weighing all my options, but again, like I'm not getting those looks that I, I thought I deserved or wanted, I guess maybe I didn't deserve mm-hmm. them, but I, the looks that I really wanted and, I made the decision with another, another guy who went on trial there. We're like, yeah, let's do it. And, you know, we'll ball out and help this team, you know, gain promotion. And then after that, it's like, we really thought, you know, like, what is it saying? Like the, the, like the flood levels, I can't remember the saying, but like, we just thought after that. Flood gates would would open or something. Yeah. Yeah. Something like the flood gates would open. I think that's (laughs) it. And we just thought like after this, it would be like, okay, now we have the stats, we have the video, we're in a, um, a more professional situation, a better club, um, they have better connections. And so I go back to Sweden a second year um, for a better team, better league, and I'm doing well again. I'm leading the league in assists. I'm playing like eight. What league was this? Of, this was in the, so I started my career actually in the sixth year of, of Swedish football. This was in the fifth year. Mm-hmm. So division three. Oh, yeah. yeah. So division three. So I, I mean, still like I, I, it's a I decent level. I more, yeah. It's a decent level. It's good. Yeah. It's, it's good. Um, some good players, um, yeah. a lot of young players that are kind of just coming up and then hopefully exactly. getting into like, you know, better teams or professional, like U23 professional teams. Mm-hmm. And, but I'm doing well. And I, I knew I could do well. I knew my potential was a little better than, than this level. So, um, yeah, I was leading the league in assists. We were doing well. We were first at the table. And then we get this, like, we have to sit with the, with the, with the president and some, some sporting directors. And they were like, look, like, the Swedish football is really coming down on foreigners in the leagues lower than Division, division One, So Division uh-huh. Two, Division Three, Division Four. Um maybe had something to do with the year before when we had 10 Americans in Sweden. Um, I've heard stories where like teams in Northern Sweden would bring in like six or seven African guys and then really, you know, kind of put them in one like tiny little house and, you know, just kind of take advantage of like people who shouldn't be taken advantage of, you know, like Crazy, man. worse and those guys and, put up with it, you know, those, you know, I mean, that's they, what's always they, amazed me with Africans, man. They're just, They'll take, that's, you know, that's, I always compare, like whenever someone like, you know, bashes their situation, I put it into perspective with those guys. These guys, they'll sleep on a floor just to get an opportunity, man. Like, and they're always smiling. They're always happy. So it's like, dude, if they could be happy in that situation, I gotta, I say to myself, stop being a, you know, you know, stop being a little bitch and and, and put it into perspective, man. (laughs) <laughs> yeah i mean like we're spoiled, I'm serious, right? like, hey, yeah. we're, we're spoiled. We, we expect these things i mean exactly. especially when you play college ball when you play college ball and you see like the facilities like a, a university has a college has yeah. you know a lot of professional or semi or a lot of professional teams don't have those things like a 100%. like a 
a Kentucky or like a Stanford. Stanford. You're not gonna get that unless you're like nah. in the first Bundesliga, man. Like even second Bundesliga does not have the yeah. weight rooms and the physio exactly. rooms and shit. The exactly. stadium might be a little cooler, but they don't have all that extra shit that like the campus mm. of these big D1 schools have. And I had a, a fraction of that, but still. But yeah, I mean, where was I with that? Like, yeah, that one that we're we're spoiled when it when it, in comparison yeah. to to African players that are coming over and they don't have that safety net that I have or someone else may have, where they could go back and get a job or something like this. Is exactly. they're trying to get a way out and they're trying to better their family. Mm. And, yeah, I guess they, for for these reasons and, you know, teams taking advantage of them, they were like, yeah, they're cutting down on it and we can't extend your visa. Like, we can't we can't fulfill your visa for the full year this time. Mm. And we were like, you got to be kidding me. We tried, like, some some things. I almost, like, enrolled in a Swedish university just because I felt like I was doing well enough and... I was getting there was like a little talk of uh, of some interest from some some bigger teams and some connections that we were making there, but then after that it was like, what's next? I had to mm. go home. I had to I'm go sure. home like two three mm. weeks later, and mm. again didn't know what was next. I was I was like, here we are again, back to the drawing board. Mm-hmm. No, and, and and man, Sweden is such a beautiful country. You know, the people are so nice. I mean, great, great quality place. But no, I, it's it's tough. The visa situation there, for some reason, is a little tougher than other other countries in Europe. Um, mm-hmm. Wonder why, but ha, is, is how. Yeah, it is. I don't know. Maybe I mean, I know with I know they did. They wanted to stop taking advantage of of these things. I know a lot of people were complaining that there was too many non Swedish players or too many non European players. Yeah. So what that means to me, non-European players, is like there's too many African players. They probably don't care as much about USA, but they're, uh, I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of, there's still a lot of, you know, racism in, in, in those areas too. You know, yes, that's, yes, unfortunately. In, in, in Europe in general, I mean, people think that Europe is, in, is so far ahead of the U.S., but in reality, I mean, there's, still so much racism here too yeah they just uh they find a better way to not expose it as much you know yeah but there's i mean there's still so many pockets when you get into some areas you know especially outside of cities i find so yeah it was tough i mean i was i was out of there much earlier than i thought and it was not at a good time um i kind of had to move quickly and um luckily my co-host and friend sean was out in Germany. So one of the biggest things when you're on something like this is who you know, who mm-hmm. you can trust, who trusts you, you know, like cause if he's helping me, he's got to put his name out there for someone exactly. and kind of put his reputation on the line. But we, um, we had very similar mindsets and he knew what I was doing. We were keeping up with each other, staying close and mm-hmm. we played together in college. So I reached out to him and then I can't remember, maybe it was, Less than a month later, I was on a plane out to Germany. So it was a big, big change. Um, Mm -hmm. It was like from April into or May into June. So kind of right heading into that summer transfer window where I had that quick, like, okay, can't rest at home. I don't want to be in New York right now. Like I got to find what's next. Mm -hmm. No, I love that. And and it's something I always, that advice that I always try to give, you know, younger players, even, you know, players of our age who haven't been in the game long is, you know, really whoever you meet and whoever you're playing with just be just be first of all a good person act like a professional on and off the field and show your ability on the field because you never know whose uncle's a sporting director here whose dad the director here or where they're gonna play next year if they're asking mm-hmm. for a, a guy as a number eight or a number six um and and having those true like i said in the beginning those true strong relationships of trust on both sides is huge because you know personally from from my side you know i've um you know people have helped me out i've helped others out but there have also been others who've reached out to me who yeah they were good players but off the field they weren't doing the right things and and i think the biggest thing when coming to europe especially as a foreigner is you know um bringing good energy and 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 really trying to bring 
um, like that winner mindset to the culture. Mm -hmm. And um, I think trying to show people that wherever you go, you know, you may not see those results right away, but in, in two, three years, four years, you don't know where that person may be, whether they help you out or you help them out. Yeah, exactly. You really never know. It's like one long job interview where you're just kind of, you just should make the best impression of yourself as much as you can, really. I mean, luckily with Sean, he knew who I was and we had spent a lot of, you know, key moments together in our soccer careers. But, you know, it happens all the time. And especially when you go into a team, like you have to gel with those players because if you're a foreigner coming in, you're automatically different. One, you don't, you don't speak the same mother tongue as them. So mm -hmm. you have to come in and then there has to be, you know, you're already kind of looking from behind from that. Like you're already kind of one level down. So you exactly. have to do some of the other things that make you, I guess, not seem as different because you have to gel in and they can't get this feeling like, oh, it's, you know, he's, he's not helping us, you know? Yes. So you have to do everything else in that. And, and a lot of that is, you know, just making good impressions, you know, putting the work in all that, all those things. It's just kind of being a good teammate, being the best version of yourself to, to do well in those situations. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so where'd the journey lead you from there? Were you staying at the big man Vinberg's apartment? <laughs> How was that looking? <laughs> yeah, it was. So he had this like, God, it was small. I mean, he lived, he had a roommate, right? So he was um, signed for a team in the Oberliga. So the fifth tier in Germany. And yeah, I came out. He's like, look, I can get you like a trial with my team. You can come to the one. You can come to the first training. I think that's all I knew was like I'd come to this one training, mm. and then we'll see if we'll see it from there. And so I get there. I think I landed like mid morning, maybe noon. And um, the Oberliga, they don't they train at night, so you know all these guys have full time jobs or part time jobs or are in unis. But the, usually mm. it's five, six, seven o'clock these training sessions. So I hop off a plane. And we get catch some lunch and then I go to this training. And the first time they're they're playing a friendly against um some team. I don't think it was very good, maybe a few mm -hmm. leagues down and Berserk's League I like seventy or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think I only got like twenty minutes because they were they were just starting their preseason or in the middle of their preseason. So they were just kind of taking a look at guys and I don't even know what he expected or anything, but I came in scored like I think literally like the first play that I was involved in so wow. 30 seconds into it Jeez. and yeah I mean it was not a great team so I just felt like I just have to go out and just do well for a little bit and goal's then after that goal, he was man. like huh goal's a goal man good yeah, team goal's a goal. for, sure. for sure yeah yeah for sure and um yeah he was impressed with it and he told um, he kind of had some broken English and Sean's was, Sean's was still, I think, pretty good at the time. His is re really good now, but he was yeah, basically I saw that like, interview the other day, man. That guy was, yeah. yeah. It, it's, uh, it, it's, it's brought me back into the books. So I'm, I'm trying yeah. to learn again now. <laughs> but he, he talked to the coach and he was like, the coach was like, yeah, keep coming. You know, I like, keep coming. We're going to figure out how to get or figure out like this contract. Mm. And yeah, so I only went on one trial, did well, and ended up signing for them. Um, it was a little shady. The owner was shady. So I didn't, uh, you know, prom g gentleman promises were made that weren't really fulfilled. And mm -hmm. the night before my debut, I actually, like, twisted my ankle. I was out for mm -hmm. two or three weeks after that. Nothing crazy, but it was just like, oh, yeah, here we go, another thing. And, yeah, I was staying at the big man Vinberg's, um mansion in a seven square meter room that was like as big as Harry Potter's closet uh, yeah, yeah. and you know it fit it fit I had a little twin bed had a little closet and yeah it was tough for a little bit I think I was in there for oh maybe I was in there longer than I thought but I was in there for some months and mm. but I played on that team um I did well enough where I was scoring some goals and I was playing and I was only at that team for a half year. Mm. So 
then the next year came the so that was into the the winter window and i had signed this was part of it is why this gentleman's agreement like i i wasn't getting as much as i was supposed to be getting in terms of, mm-hmm. of money and stuff but we inserted this thing where it was like six months i could be out i could be out of my contract in six months which was very key because like this wasn't the final destination i knew i could play higher than this level mm-hmm. so luckily i worked with uh, an agent here who's my agent now who do describe you know a similar guy on your podcast was just someone who's you know just kind of helping you for the right reasons you know just a good person that just doesn't just awesome. want you know your money or anything is really looking out for you and you know values you as a friend too it's not just like an agent it's like it's he's, yeah. he's actually one of my really good friends which and is so rare so rare so rare in this game especially if they're not making a ton of money off of you because then that could be that fake friendship but if they're not even making that much money off of you it's kind of like why are you doing this but then there mm. are some very few and far between but there are some people who are just yeah. you know doing it for the right reasons and you know believe in you as a player as a person or whatever it may be mm-hmm. and which is interesting yeah. you know as humans we always think like yeah i mean we're looking out for ourselves you know we're like oh he's doing this what is he what kickback is he getting what kickback does he want and then like when he's just trying to be a nice person you're like damn you know it's it's nice to find those gems. I almost felt bad, like thinking, like, what does this guy want? Like, kind of being, you know, I, maybe it's just the American in me. We're just kind it of is, being yeah. like, what is, what is this guy's like real? Exactly. exactly. You know, like, what's he playing? Like, what is? Yeah. You know? yeah. But no, nah, I mean, fantastic guy. You don't meet many like these. So, you know, in my gut, I knew I could trust him after you know a few times just being around him and seeing some of the things he was trying to do for me. And so that team that I was on, I was actually on with Sean, but there was a lot of problems with the team where we weren't doing well. And then there was problems with guys getting paid, not just me. And, you know, a lot of guys quit actually. We're like, you know, we're not going to play for this owner and he's, you know, screwing us over like this. The coaches quit too. And it was like in complete disarray. So luckily I got onto a team that was doing better. Um, another Oberliga team, but they were more mid table. We mm. were on like a kind of a bottom table team. And yeah, like this was in the, um, the winter, the winter right before Corona. So like January, we're in preseason. February, we play like two or three games and then season gets postponed at that time. That's all we knew. Mm. Mm. And, you know, we're sitting on our ass and, you know, just trying to stay fit. Sean and I, we were living together at the time in a better apartment at this point. So I wasn't just living in the closet. I was, you know, a little more comfortable at this time. And yeah, we were just like trying to stay fit, just doing the home workout shit, doing all that kind of stuff. And that season got completely canceled. And I went home for a little bit and then came back and talked to my agent. He was like, yeah, like we got, I got like a few trials with some Regan Liga teams. And so I went on with one. Um, they they just weren't, they were kind of interested, but then they were like, yeah, we're looking at some other players. And then they kind of played that game where they didn't, we were reaching out to them and they weren't really reaching out back to us. So yeah. we're like, okay, well, we can't rely on this. So it's at the end of the game, day, they didn't. I always relate it to my friends, man. Like that game, like, like trying to get a girl, like, you know, they're playing hard to get. It's it's literally the same thing with, with teams, you know, like if, if you're, if you're putting in more of the work to try to get the date or, you know, get the trial or get the signing, it's like, nah, you know, it's not going to work. Maybe, man. But I, I think at the end of the day, they just weren't interested and they were just kind of like, yeah. we won't tell them no in case we don't find someone else. So he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. he still has in mind. But yeah, I ended up kind of being a bust. And then I went on trial with another team um like a week trial and they were like yeah we just don't we don't see it enough um i thought i did okay but I, that was one of the trials i thought i could have done better at and then sean had had moved up to the Regional liga so my friend was in the fourth tier at that time and my agent helped me get a trial with his team and i was on trial there man for like three weeks i did well i'm like really buddy buddy with a lot of the guys and I still have a relationship with them because like I was gelling with a lot of players there and 
I was playing well. I did well in the friendlies. You know, I was like showing what I could bring to the team. I was always first or second in the fitness test. Like I'm showing out and they were, I don't know if they were leading me on. There were some things going on behind, but they had like one more roster spot and then they ended up giving it to like a more local guy, mm. younger guy, you know, kind of came up in the youth system, I guess. So I mm-hmm. think there might've been some pressure from, I don't know who, but for some yeah. reason they decided not to take me. And this is after three weeks and just, you know, Sean and I were making plans like, you know, this year we're going to do this. Like we were thinking about how we were going to move into this apartment together and like, you know, really launch or do better with our podcast. Cause we'd be like in the same, same vibe, same environment. Mm-hmm. And I just thought like, of course they're going to take me. Like yeah. everyone's acting like I'm on the team already. Um, you know, I'm playing well, like I'm, I'm going to, I think I'm going to start on this team or, at least mm-hmm. in my starting position. And then like, yeah, I get this translated voice message. That's like, yeah, like we're not going to take him. Um, he can come to training tomorrow and, you know, we can talk more. And I was like, almost, I was almost like, te- I was like kind of teary eyed. Yeah. Because it was just like, fucking after all this, man, like there's a three oh, no's in a row. the worst, man. Like when you, like you said, when you gel with the teammates and one of those where the teammates are like, yo, when are you going to sign? Like, you yeah. know, we need you, this, that. And then so it's like, talking man, about how like, many stats I'm going to have. They're like, how many goals exactly. are you going to have this season? Like, I'm like, I'm yeah. in here. Like, what's the deal? Exactly. Oh, bro. Look, I think I've had like two or three of those myself. It, it just leaves a bad taste in your mouth. Oh, hundred percent. Yeah. And it was really, it was really, that night was really tough. Cause it was like, I think Sean and I were actually supposed to release or record a podcast that we were going to release the next day. And I was like, look, Sean, like, I can't, I can't get on and, and bullshit my way through this. Like, I'm, I'm not feeling good about this. This was like a very hard, th- I mean, like I said, sometimes the no's are very hard to take. So that night it was hard to take. And I was, I didn't really sleep much. It was like, you know, what's going to happen next. And somehow um, a team that was in this league too. So eventually the team that I'm with now, mm. they're, usually a top four top five club in the regional league here in this in this area and you know they're a good team good players um guys who have played at really good levels um both domestic and abroad and they're like yeah we're looking for an eight like can you come on trial they were talking to my agent with this so the sunday night i get a rejection from that team that sunday night is very tough monday i go to trial with the next team I was like, I couldn't even think about that now. So like when you asked me before, I kind of had that in mind. Like I didn't have time. Like I had that night, but I didn't have time after that to feel sorry for myself or doubt myself. Cause here I had another golden opportunity where at least I could play in front of someone. I could play in front of a team. And then, you know, some kind of weirdly enough, some stars aligned with that one where, mm. you know, some guys left so some roster spots opened i was kind of a player they didn't have and you know and then i did well on the trials and still after that they were like we're not sure because we have this one roster spot left and we wanted to take a forward and then like they found a way where one forward left and they had two spots open then like kind of last minute ish Mm. and then I ended up signing for that team. It was like kind of weird how it all came together, but it goes back to that notion where a lot of people said no. And this team was actually historically, I mean, and that season and the season prior to that were better than these teams that said no to me, much Mm -hmm. better. Mm -hmm. And had, you know, maybe better facilities and a better name and, you know, better, maybe better coaching or whatever. It was just seen as a more professional and better club. Mm-hmm. And it was, it was just like all these people said no. And then they said yes. And this is supposed to be the better team. And all the teams that, you know, are a little lower said no. It was like kind of, it was, it comes back to what we said very early in this podcast where all you need is that one. Yes. And that yes was better than, than the no's that I received. 
because mm. it got like this was just an opportunity that I didn't think I was going to be able to get, especially after hearing no from that team. But mm-hmm. I mean, here we are. No, I love that. And I, and I always, when I hear these type of stories, you know, same type of things I've had myself is, <clears throat> you know, that meme um, where the guy, he's like a, it's a cartoon character and he has like a, you know, an ax or whatever yeah, it is. And yeah, yeah, yeah. there's like gold on the other side, you know? And, mm-hmm. um, you know, if he just hit it one more time and the wall banged down, he would hit the gold, but it's, you know, at that very last moment he, he gave in, but I mean, obviously, like we said in the beginning, you have to realize that you have the ability, you can play at that level and you, you know, you feel you can yourself, uh, to keep on going. Um, and you know, the, this team, like you said, it, it, it actually worked out for the better. And sometimes, you know, there, it's not a, like, like you said, the trial before was a bit more smooth. You thought it would work out, but this, you know, Sometimes those stars have to align. Injuries, players leave, money issues. Mm-hmm. Um, and you just take that opportunity and run with it, which it seems like you, you've done. Yeah, I kind of realized that some things were, with both situations, They were some things were, I think in the, the, the earlier trials, I think I could have done better on the first two teams that said no. So I kind of took some takeaways. For, I, I had some takeaways from that, like, okay, what I can improve on in these trials and what I can do more. Mm-hmm. So I thought I brought that into the third one that they ultimately said no, you know, and it was just like, yeah, I just didn't, I didn't have, I didn't have time to, to doubt myself in that moment. I just, mm-hmm. here was another opportunity. It was like, yeah, this was tough to deal with, but look, here's the next one. I think it's kind of like one of the the good things about the, um, that American outlook was like the never yes. give up attitude that I was kind of instilling and bringing over here was like, I mean, maybe it was good that I didn't have time to like, you know, wallow in that no and be sorry for myself. Maybe that mm-hmm. would have planted some more doubt. So maybe the timing of it was good or maybe it was challenging and I did well with the challenge. I mean, I, mm-hmm. I, I don't know, but I knew at the time, okay, that's done. Now I have to focus on this. Here we go. Mm-hmm. No, I love that. And and I could relate to that as well myself where, you know, I would, you know, text my, my stepdad or my mom, usually my stepdad and some kind of, you know, thing didn't work out for me, uh, whether it was a bad training or a bad match, didn't, didn't sign. And he would always just text me back three simple words, never give in, you know, Winston Churchill. And, and I always think about that, man. And it's mm-hmm. like you said, you bring that American mentality over to Europe and they're not used to that. And sometimes, I mean, you know, I mean, I know on the team right now that I'm on that, that's the attitude they love, like that I try to bring to, to what I do um, and try to instill in, in some of these players that weren't brought up that way. And uh, no, I think like, like you said, from the beginning, you know, um, really trying to like the belief focusing on, you know, believing in yourself and, 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 Playing to your strengths is huge, um, but yeah, man, been been quite the story. And you know, how how long have you been there now? Where you're at? So, I mean, I I've been. This is my second season. I just signed uh, another extension, a year extension. Um, unfortunately, the last season we only got through a, a, some amount before that next wave really kind of hit Europe, especially in Germany. So Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. they postponed and then ultimately canceled that season again. But um, yeah, that's when I, I mean, did nothing to deserve this, I guess, but uh, maybe some of my story was from, you know, the struggles I had before. But when I joined this team um, last summer, they had won the, the, the Hamburg cup. So they've won like the city district cup where now they can play in the DFB Pokal. So that's the, the German cup for those of you who don't mm-hmm. know. Similar to the US Open Cup in America or the FA Cup in uh, in England. And so then you get a chance to play, you know, some of the top Bundesliga teams in a, in a tournament that stretches the, the whole season. And we were drawn with Bayer Leverkusen. And, you know, I got to play in that game. We got, we kind of got smacked. Um, we played them at their stadium. Usually you play at your home stadium. It gives you a little more of an advantage. Mm-hmm. Um, 
but we played at their stadium because of like the Corona restrictions. They could easily, they could more easily deal with them. And, you know, we stayed at the hotel, which was like built into the stadium. And it was a crazy experience for me. I mean, playing against a team, they played, you know, all their guys. We played in the stadium, you know, amongst fans. It was on like ESPN and it was, I only, I played the second half because I was still coming into the team. You know, I, I, I didn't have the, the trainers, the coaches um, trust yet. Mm. So I kind of came into that situation just like, God, like this is, this is crazy. And I'm just super grateful to be here. Mm-hmm. And I got subbed on in the second half. And honestly, it was like a weird feeling. Cause like, I felt like I would be more nervous, you know, like I thought I'd be like, Holy shit. I went from playing, not to bad mouth it, but I was, I was playing fifth tier against guys, you know, who maybe were a little out of shape and stuff. You know, they have the good touch here in Europe and stuff. They're yeah. always good at these levels. But I went from mm-hmm. playing these guys to playing, you know, guys who were worth $30 million on transfer market. Like Kai Havertz yeah. just got sold the week before, I think, for like $90 million to Chelsea. Yeah. And I just thought I would be like more nervous. But I, I think the score helped. I went in and it was like 5 or 6 zero already. Like we didn't have a good nothing first to lose, half. man. I went in zero, especially with that attitude, man. Like I have yeah. nothing to lose. Just and, the game. and that that's awesome. I played well, given the circumstances. You know, they still had yeah. crazy amount of possession, but I like had a few good tackles, and you know, I I from that actually performance, like I put some trust into um, the trainers and the owner, and then I got more chances after that, and I played in I think five or six. Uh, games that season before it got canceled mm. and then there was like a whole long period where we didn't know if we would start we didn't know if the season would stop so a lot of zoom trainings and shit like that and it was i mean tough yeah, i know a lot trainings. of teams a lot of yeah it was it was super tough for a while man it was yeah. like like i can't believe this shit and then you look at america and they're starting to play again you're like god damn it like what yeah. am i doing again? yeah and then, yeah, like um, the season got ultimately canceled and now we're on the second season. Everything's going well so far. We had another, we won our cup again and we ended up playing um, Hanover 96, which is a second Bundesliga team, but they are a historic Bundesliga team where they've, I think they were only relegated three or four years ago, something like this. Mm-hmm. Um, we're playing them at our stadium this time and we ended up losing 4-0, but um, I played 90 minutes. And honestly, at times we looked maybe not the better team, but we looked like we could play with them. Like we gave up a few kind of, you know, silly mistakes and those those big teams that are making millions will, will pounce on you for that kind of yes. shit. But, you know, there was murmurs in the press and stuff after like who was the second, who was the second tier team? Because at times we were really moving the ball. Like we'd move out from the back. Like we broke presses from them and it was at the end. I mean, we still lost four zero. So what does that, that get us? But it was, it was still, it was still cool to play in. And these, these experiences when I was, you know, kind of going through it in Australia and things like this and first year in Sweden, it it makes it all worth it, man. Like it's super crazy to think about. I got some Mm -hmm. jerseys that I exchanged with some guys who, you know, maybe worth, a lot more money in the future but yeah i mean just the experiences of these things like are crazy can't wait mm-hmm, I, mm-hmm. I love telling people about it when i see people at home and you know like the things you can't wait to tell your children you know one day it's like these are the, the moments that i are really at like some of the milestones i've had in my career mm-hmm, mm-hmm. no unbelievable and like i always like to say you know it might be a you know I don't really think of it as a negative mindset, but there are, there are many more lows than there are highs in this game. But if, if you're willing to endure those lows and, and, and learn from them, like you did in Australia, like you did in those two times in Sweden, um, you enjoy the highs that much more, you know? Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, it just goes to show that when you embrace the darkness and you try to take as much as you can out of the darkness, the light is just that much more you know, beautiful, as we can see with the sun, you know, this podcast getting yeah. dark now. <laughs> yeah, I came out at the perfect time. I mean, you're 100% right. Like, I feel like if I had just walked into the opportunities I'm getting now where I'm playing these, you know, these teams and playing in 
cool stadiums and, and, and league games and, you know, the environment that I'm in right now. I don't know if I would appreciate it as much. I don't know if I would be so grateful for everything I have right now if I didn't exactly. have all of those, you know, road bumps and kind of the things where made me question if I really wanted to do this. Mm-hmm. And luckily, you know, there was never a time where I was really so serious about hanging up the boots. Um, but I think all of those little, you know, those little things kind of made me. They made me the player I am today, both, you know, physically and mentally. And I think they, they just made me a much more grateful and just, you know, super appreciative of everything that I do have now. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Love it, man. Love it. Yeah, man. It's been a, been a great podcast. Love, love listening to your, to your story, it's, man. It's really. weird being on this side of the podcast. To be honest <laughs> with you. I'm so used to like, you know, engaging people to talk. I was like, Damn, I'm yeah. talking too much. I was like, oh wait, nah, oh dude, it's, maybe it's all right. Yeah, dude, it's it's nice to be able to, you know, let it all out, and it's it's actually really, as you're talking and you're like reliving it, and you, you really just um, give yourself, you know, that much. You got to give yourself that much more credit. Be proud of yourself where you're at, and uh, yeah, man. I mean, I'm sure the the listeners and and the viewers learned a lot. Um, let's end off so. on on the one that you asked me. I don't know if it's the we exact switched, one. we we switched it since then, so we you okay. will ask a different question now because we didn't want to uh we don't want to bite off you. Oh come on, bite! It's all good. I mean, <laughs> uh, so yeah, man. If if you could go back to any any age, you know, and then I know a lot of people, you know, they try to dis, you know get away from this question by saying no regrets or whatever. Let, let's try to answer this. <laughs> if, uh, <laughs> if you go back to any, easy no, yeah, yeah, if you could go back to any age with the wisdom you have today, what age would you go to and what would you tell yourself? Hmm. So again, way, I, I think I get this one off, off Lewis Howe, so I don't take the credit. Hey man, it's yeah, we're all just trying to ask like some good questions. You find yeah. it from somewhere else. Yeah. Um, no, I won't give you the cop out answer, but like, it's tough because I do feel like everything that's happened and the the path that I've taken has helped me come to a a place where I'm very happy at right now. But I I to to answer the question, I feel like with the knowledge I have, ooh. It's tough, man, because I could either put it like to high school, but I just feel like I would be way too immature to to understand just the level of of what I'm getting from an experience like this. So I feel like I was yeah. still kind of so hung up on the titles of things, you know, the American, yes. the the how much weight, or you know, I'm a professional footballer. I play in the MLS, and that's it. Yeah, that's yeah, the only yeah. place I can play. I think maybe there, honestly, because all those experiences after college were super needed, but I feel like if I kind of went into, into high school and maybe into to college with that same, same mindset where like no fear, you know, like play my game, build myself and don't be so worried about what people think. Mm. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's a hundred percent to that last sentence. It kind of me. Yes spring on there has, has brought me to the answer I want to give is high school. I feel like if I would have brought this level of confidence and just belief in myself and not caring what people think, I don't know. I think you just, I think I could have, you know, maybe I have a higher ceiling if I would have started that mind mm-hmm. state a little, a little earlier, you know, of course, which is so tough much, answer, so much easier answer, though, man. I wanted to say no regrets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's so much easier said than done, man, because that's that's also what I like I experienced the same thing, man, and and it's natural, you know, it's really just a natural human instinct to especially at a younger age when your brain's more malleable and you get a lot of opinions in your head, uh people are telling you to do this, do that, not do that. It's tough not to not to care what other people think, but like you said, man, I think it's such a you know, even though thing I, at, at that age too, you know, it's like such yeah, a status yeah. thing. And it's like, to think about it now, it seems so silly, but yes. it's just a, a different level that we just weren't ready for mentally. Like it's mm-hmm, just mm-hmm. to think of how much I cared about how I did something or, 
you know, just, you know, being someone that could kind of fit in with the, with the crowd and, you know, not really truly being myself. You know, I think I found friends where I was able to do that, but it's still at that age. It's like, yeah, you're, you're too wrapped around what other people think and what other people's perception of you is instead of just like mm-hmm. starting to really unlock what you are, who you are and like the potential you can bring to something. You know? Yeah. And I no, dude, I completely, I a hundred percent agree. And I think one of the biggest parts of it is, you know, in that high school age, we're stuck in this bubble. We think the most important thing is to be the coolest kid in high school, uh, hang out with the popular kids, go to the parties, do this, do that. And we look back at it now, it's just like you laugh and it's like, all that stuff doesn't even matter. Anyway, those, 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 um, you know, those top popular kids, you know, in high school, where are they at now? So it's like, you know, at the end of the day, you you gotta, you know, like, like we've done, um, chase what you want to chase and really believe in what you believe in. Because when you do, I think others catch that drift, catch that energy from you and, you know, they'll be inspired by you, you know? Yeah. I appreciate that, man. I mean, I, I'm, I'm no finished project project, you know, like I feel like there's still things I'm learning, some things I want to improve on that maybe in a few years I'll look back and be like, it was silly that I, you know, thinking like this, but I feel like Mm -hmm. when your heart's in the right position and you're kind of, you're doing things for the right reasons, that's what I try and encourage people to do because, you know, maybe your dream isn't like anything like this. So I don't always want to, you know, give this notion that it's like, this is the best way to do things, but, but your way has to be your way, not someone else's way. It has to be like your own path and has to be true to yourself, your values. And if you have shitty values, then I guess that's just on you. Like I can't really help you there, but I just, I want people to do things for the right reasons, follow their dreams, just, you know, be grateful for what they have and really just realize that this is like your life. It's no one else's. And if you live for other people, then you'll never truly be one, you know, as happy as you can be. And you won't just be hitting that ceiling of, of, of potential of who you can be. And like, you know, you, your potential could be wasted on something that you're doing right now. So I, with, with our podcast, with footwork, with, you know, with you, I find inspiration in your stuff a lot with other guys too. And I just, I hope, um, people can take these lessons some things that we've learned like we learn from other people and just see like there's there's not one path and you know you can do whatever you can do just if you put 100 percent into it you know you have that self-belief and you do things out of love and for the right reasons and not just to get something out of it always mm-hmm. no i love it man let's let's end off on that really appreciate you coming on man um drop drop some some plugs where can people find you get people so, um, on the, the footwork grind yeah yeah hit us up i mean we had rick if you want to start with that episode like amazing episode where we chopped it up for for almost maybe two hours or something like that yeah, so yeah. We, we we said it all it was a great episode and we can't wait to have you you back on again um Love it. but yeah find us at footwork podcast uh we're on Insta- instagram footwork underscore podcast you can find me, Dylan, uh, two N's underscore Williams. Um, yeah, you can find us anywhere, YouTube, Twitter, these things. We're, we're, we're building the brand. So we think we have some good content and we're just trying to take ourselves to the next level. So hopefully you guys, um, you know, find some things in there. Reach out to us anytime. You know, we, we try and answer as many people as that reach out to us with any questions mm-hmm. and try and help as many people as we can, you know kind of doing the same same thing different things but you know we believe in making your own path following your dreams and putting everything both mentally and physically into it so that sounds like something that's up people's alleys um hopefully it is because i'm i'm sure people who are you know like rick fit i think they would like footwork too so you know come over come over see some some uh some of the stuff we're putting out and Mm -hmm. Yeah, keep supporting this guy, man. Rick Fit, the legend. Appreciate it, brother. And I was gonna say, you know, if if 
honestly, like if um, you guys and girls DM me on Instagram and, and I don't answer, uh, unfortunately, those 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 uh, DMs have really gotten flooded. Go over to their page, shoot them the same message, and they'll probably no, really, they'll probably have a similar answer. No, you're right. He's right. No, similar he's right. answer to I mean, me, uh, unless it's a gets, sweet ting, you know. <laughs> hey, hey, you got to answer the ones you got to. You got to answer. I mean, no, no. Rick. Rick is at that. I can't imagine how many messages you get with the amount of followers and stuff. So, yeah, people can't take that personally. But if if you don't get an answer, you know, maybe you'll get an answer from from one of us so yeah and then they've been on the same same journey we have very similar mindsets so yeah but thank you guys and girls uh thank you dylan uh appreciate it and, and best of luck with your season brother thank you man i pre really appreciate you having me on all right brother we'll keep in touch all the best all right deuces homie